And indeed, many, many studies over many decades show that exercise improves physical and mental health. And we know that people with addiction can abstain longer and get into recovery from their addiction. You have to start somewhere. And so if you start with one minute a day, I mean, there are, there is evidence showing that the healthiest people on the planet drink. Anya Nanseo, Book and Life Channel. My name is Anna Lemke. I am a physician. I practice at the Stanford University School of Medicine in Stanford, California. And indeed, many, many studies over many decades show that exercise improves physical and mental health. Um, it also helps with addiction. So we know that withdrawal from drugs and alcohol goes faster and is easier to tolerate if we exercise. And we know that people with addiction can abstain longer and get into recovery from their addiction, more likely to get into recovery if they exercise. So how is it working? If we go back to this pleasure pain balance, we, we know that when we press on the pleasure side, those gremlins press, press on the pain side before going back to the level position. It turns out if we press on the pain side, those gremlins will hop on the pleasure side and we will actually get our dopamine in directly. In some, what happens when we exercise is that our body senses a minor injury and in response starts to upregulate our body's own reparative mechanisms. And one of the ways that our body does that is by upregulating feel-good neurotransmitters like dopamine, like serotonin, like norepinephrine. So we actually get high in the aftermath of exercise, which is the opposite of intoxicants, right? Drugs and alcohol get us high quickly and immediately, but then we have this come down afterwards. Whereas with exercise, first we have to do the work, then we get a release of dopamine, which then remains elevated for hours afterwards. So, so things like exercise are a really nice way to get our dopamine indirectly by paying for it up front. The problem is we have to make sure that we don't over exercise, right? You don't want to exercise so much that you start that we start to injure our bodies or we over get over training syndrome. That would not be good. It has to be not too much, but also not too little. I think even one minute is better than nothing. There's this there's this famous saying: a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You have to start somewhere, and so if you start with one minute a day, sometimes I'll actually say to patients, just start with five minutes a day or ten minutes. It's the initial that's hard. Once people are into the activity, they find they would like to go on longer. So I think, you know, even one minute a day is, is better than nothing. I think that the data show that it, it depends on the person. For some people, exercise is better. For others, it might be later evening. However, if it starts to get to be too late in the evening, people can get an, a cortisol surge or an adrenaline surge that then keeps them up through the night. So really, if we're going to exercise later in the day, we should do it a good four to eight hours before bedtime. And remember, we ideally want to go to bed when the sun goes down. So I think if we were going to make any interpretation from the data, it would be that exercise should come in the early, ideally in the earlier part of the day. But if the only time you have to exercise is later in the day, that's better than no exercise. You know, there's no one exercise that's best for every person. I think it's very individual depending upon, you know, your own body, your own interests, where you live, you know, what's accessible, whatever physical or mental limitations you may have. Whatever you can do uh, that doesn't harm your body, that you can sustain for long enough to improve cardiovascular health and improve mental health, um, that's a good thing. I mean, there are there is evidence showing that the healthiest people on the planet drink mo no more than one to two standard drinks per week. No more than one to two standard drinks per week. So that's and and that any amount of smoking is bad for you. So I'm not smoking anything. Not um, pulling any hot substance into your lungs is really important. People who exercise in moderation, eat in moderation, uh, who avoid ultra processed food, those are sort of universal lifestyle things. One of the ones that tends to be really important when it comes to mood is to match, match our behavior to the natural circadian rhythms of the earth. So we should really be asleep when it's dark and the sun is down. Uh, when the sun gets up, we should get up. We should go out and expose ourselves to early morning sunlight. Um, we should move our bodies. 
And then, of course, a universal imperative is you know, connection to other people, to animals, to nature. These are things that uh, all humans need for a thriving life. Well, you know, addiction is a biopsychosocial disease. That means there are biological components to the disease, things like your inherited genetic risk or epigenetic risk based on behaviors that change expressions of proteins, uh, whether or not you have a co-occurring mental disorder. There are uh, psychosocial contributors. So how you were raised, whether or not you had parents who, who modeled addictive behavior, whether there were drugs around the house growing up, how accessible those drugs are to you, poverty, unemployment, all of those are risk factors and play a role. So if we think about the causes or the risks of addiction as being biological, psychological, and social, that means we have to intervene at those different levels. So biological remedies are things like abstaining from our drug of choice for 30 days to reset reward pathways. There are medications that we can use to treat various forms of addiction. Um, so those are some of the biological pieces. Psychological pieces, we know that individuals individual and group therapy can help um, with people struggling with addiction, so various forms of, of therapy. And then the social or contextual piece is things like 12-step groups, like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Sexaholics Anonymous, Internet and Technology Addicts Anonymous. Those are 12-step mutual help groups that can be very, very beneficial when people actively participate. Um, I talk about self-binding strategies, that is creating barriers between ourselves and our drug of choice so that it's not as easy to access those drugs because, again, simple access is a huge risk factor for addiction. This is things like getting the potato chips and chocolate out of the house, getting alcohol out of the house, getting rid of our cigarettes, running water over the cigarettes before we throw them away so we don't go digging in the garbage to get them out again. Uh, this is things like um, giving up uh, maybe our iPhone, our smartphone, right, and getting a flip phone so that we don't have as much mobile access to the internet. We only have our laptops or powering our phone down when we're not using it. Just that little pause, you know, to have to take the time to turn it on again might be enough to remind us, oh, wait a minute, no, I, I don't actually need my phone. I don't want to be spending time on my phone. So those are the kinds of um, environmental or social cues that we can change. I hope you got what you needed. Kamsaham nida.